ask you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16. Many of you have heard of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, but have you heard of the Leaning Tower of South Padre Island? I doubt it. It's because of the 134-unit, 31-story skyscraper near the Mexican border in the state of Texas with this unprecedented view of the ocean was torn down before it could even be completed. Almost there, so close and yet so far from what it intended to be. It was going to be amazing. Nice Italian marble floors, granite countertops, stainless steel appliances, custom cabinets, stainless steel fixtures, oversized jacuzzi tubs, valet service. It would have been epic, like many other buildings before. What happened, though? What happened to it? Why do I speak to you this afternoon with it in being in the past tense? Well, in May of 2008, the developers noticed there's cracks in the columns supporting the parking garage. The official explanation is that the parking garage and the tower to whom it was attached were not supposed to be attached. It was just a construction mistake of these two buildings because it looked like that there was a problem with them being attached. The tower had sunk 14 to 16 inches, while the attached parking garage had only sunk about 7 inches, and they were kind of ripping apart at the seam of this juncture, and the argument was that they were never supposed to have been attached. But friends, that was not actually the honest answer. The honest answer upon inspection was that they had not prepared the foundation properly for the construction of such a large building. And so... Eventually, in 2009, it was demolished. It was the largest implosion of reinforced concrete structure in the world. Gone. It's not the first problem like this in the world and found in history. Sadly, it won't be the last one. There are some countries in the world that are infamous for their construction problems. Countries like Kenya, Lagos, and Rwanda... Developers there, wanting to save money in construction costs, knowing that the materials have been prepared, yet will not put as much work in the foundation of the buildings in the hopes that the foundation will never truly get tested with any major and massive event, earthquake and the like. Only for at times those events to come across unplanned, unexpected, and they fall to the destruction of many who occupied those buildings built on the wrong foundation, or they did not properly maintain that foundation and care for it. Well, that's exactly what we learned tonight in Matthew 16, the foundation of the church, the foundation that is so central, everything rests upon it. Everything is about it. Well, the good news is, is that this is not the story of the church falling. This will be the story of the church succeeding. It will indeed stand because its foundation is secure. But the bad news, though, is some of the local expressions of that universal church of Jesus Christ will not stand. They will not stand. And this is the problem. Matthew 16, if you're just joining us tonight for the first time or you've been gone for a number of weeks, Working our way through the Gospel of Matthew, the good news of Jesus Christ, as recorded by one of the earliest followers of Jesus. His name is Matthew. He is indeed filled with the Spirit, writing under the providential hand of God, so that the followers of God would understand His Word. It had been preserved by the Holy Spirit for over 2,000 years, and we enjoy reading these words today, and our lives are being transformed by it week after week here at Grace Church. Well, tonight is no exception, if you would. Follow along as I read to you Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 20. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah. 
and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and, I, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. It's a profound text, arguably by some estimation, ground zero for all of the New Testament, ground zero for all of the Bible, that upon these few verses rests the entire church of Jesus Christ. This evening, this is mo by no means am I going to be able to exhaust all of what's being said here and the implications of it, but I want us to think through it together. Some key points we need to learn. We come right from the text. Number one, let's look at the various views of Jesus Christ. The various views of Jesus Christ. You go back to what Jesus is saying. They have moved geographically. They have continued to move in His itinerant ministry, going from one place to another. He is moving back towards now into the promised land. He has been up in the Gentile country. He is now coming back around. He's been by the lakeside. He's now in Caesarea Philippi. And so He says here, who do people say that I, who the Son of Man is? It's, a, it's an interesting question because it kind of feels like it's an open book quiz. Who do people say that I am? That's not what he says. It says, who do people say that the Son of Man is? The question is already sort of giving away the answer. It's like the teacher we all wish we had in school, that we would have better grades if we had a teacher like this. But notice the question, though. He, he doesn't want to know yet about them. He wants to know about the others. Who do people? This is a ministry that's been used to dealing with crowds. We've seen these crowds. We've seen them earlier in Matthew 13. We've seen them in Matthew 14. We've seen them in Matthew 15. We know of these crowds that Jesus himself has been feeding. The disciples have been interacting with. They have been bringing the multitudes with them to be healed. This, this is a public ministry. Nothing private here. And Jesus wants to know, who do people say that I am? Now, this phrase he uses, this term, the Son of Man, this is a term we're familiar with at this point. We're at chapter 16 in this 28-chapter record of Jesus' life, and this record shows us, as is true with the teachings of Mark and the writings of Luke and also the writings of John, this is Jesus' favorite title to refer to himself, his favorite term he uses of everything he says about himself, this is his go-to. This is his default. This is his one he keeps sort of retweeting and re-mentioning to others. And it comes from the book of Daniel, the prophet Daniel, as Daniel is describing the ancient of days, who is also known as God the Father, who brings and talks about the scrolls in which no one is worthy to open the scrolls except one like the Son of Man, Daniel says, to whom will be given rule and dominion and reign and power over all of creation. Jesus is not struggling with an identity crisis here. He's not looking to have his insecurity addressed. He is moving towards a significant conversation. You notice the answers that are given here, the various views of Jesus. John the Baptist just to remind you of the significance of John the Baptist, he came up earlier in Matthew 14. He has earlier been referenced to us in Matthew chapter 4 at the baptism of Jesus. Earlier before that is John the Baptist's birth. But in Matthew chapter 11, you have the disciples of John the Baptist came to Jesus and try to ask about his ministry, and they walk away and they give an update to John the Baptist. But then later on, John the Baptist has been arrested. Matthew 14, we see the account of Herod the Tetrarch, 
who because of this sort of perverse plot by his stepdaughter has John the Baptist beheaded. But you have to understand, people, this is not 2021. We don't get our news through Twitter. This isn't what's happening back. This isn't what's happening back then. They're not reading and watching Fox News and CNN. They're not interacting with sort of local news stations. They don't know. They don't know. Most people have never actually seen John the Baptist with their own eyes. They've heard about it. This guy's like a wild man. You guys should like, I'm telling you, what I've heard about this guy, he, he apparently wears camel's hair clothes. He's known for eating bugs. I mean, that's like, that's like vegan the next level. Seriously, he's like big on locusts and honey. Now, imagine hearing those stories, secondhand, thirdhand, fourthhand, for a couple of years, and then here comes this guy you've never met before, but he seems rather eccentric. He certainly has got a crowd. He apparently keeps, you know, upsetting the religious people, the Pharisees and the scribes. I wonder if this is John the Baptist. I wonder if I'm looking at John the Baptist. The disciples say, some think you're John the Baptist. Notice the other answer they give. Some think you're Elijah. Elijah, wait, haven't we ever seen him before? Is this Elijah's greatest hits? Is he coming back for a reunion tour? What is Elijah? Well, because this comes out of the Old Testament where Elijah was promised to appear before the day of the Lord. So they're really hoping for God to set up his reign on the earth. And so maybe this guy, we don't know what Elijah looked like. We don't know what John the Baptist looked like. We have no clue what Elijah looked like. Maybe it's him. Maybe this is him. Man, these people long for a better future. They long for a better day. Then notice what he says there. They say, some people think maybe you're Jeremiah. Jeremiah the prophet. This is based on different Jewish traditions. And then kind of like as the catch-all, like, well, I mean, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah. And then it says, or one of the prophets. I, I don't know. You're just like, you're apparently committed to upsetting the entire religious system, which sounds rather prophet-like of you. We've read in our scriptures before what Isaiah was like. Man, he wasn't making friends with the kings. We've read about Ezekiel. That guy was weird. We think John the Baptist is weird. Ezekiel is like laying on his left side for years, doing other things. I mean, like that guy just seemed like super weird, like eccentric on steroids. I don't know, maybe you're just one of these prophets. There's nothing at this point in the identification of the possible explanations of Jesus that in any way makes anybody to change their life. No implications on it as to the implication as to what this might mean. The reality is this. What he is saying here, even with the idea of him being a prophet, this isn't even unique to today. For those of you who are familiar with the teachings of Islam, maybe you have Muslim friends, maybe you're from that background. Islam believes that Jesus is a prophet. They're, they're, they're not bothered by Jesus and his teachings. They're bothered by some of you claiming he's actually more than a prophet. He's actually the son of God. They're like, slow it down. They believe Muhammad is just a greater prophet than Jesus. So these interpretations are not only not common or not unique to them, they're also not unique to us. This has been going on for thousands of years. These are the various views of Jesus. We encounter this today. You ask people, who do you say that Jesus is? I mean, ask your friends. Ask somebody to work out with. Hey, I'm curious. Jesus. Like Jesus, like Jesus, Jesus, or like Jesus, my friend, or a guy, you know, his family. Like, who are we talking about Jesus? Jesus, who are we talking about here? Jesus of Nazareth. Who do you think that he is? Hmm. I think it's a creation of some people's religious imagination. I think he's honestly a Jewish rabbi that just had some really loyal followers that kind of over-tweaked his teaching, took it a little too far. Jesus, honestly, he is like the original love child. I mean, like, he was like hippie before hippies were cool. You'll watch the answers you'll give. You'll have to ask yourself the question as a follow-up in your own mind as you maybe would post them, where do you get this belief about Jesus? Have, have you ever actually read any of the teachings of Jesus, and would you want to do that? 
I would love to do that with you. I'd love to just take a couple weeks and let's just read some of the teachings of Jesus together so that you can feel more confident in your answer of who Jesus is. For those of you who are Christians, I really challenge you to do this with your friends. Ask your friends, who do you think Jesus is? And whatever answer they give, say, what if what you believed about Jesus was wrong? Would you want to know? And do you want to read some of his teachings for yourself so that then you can confidently say you know or you do not know and you're accurate in your answers to who Jesus actually is? So first of all, the various views of Jesus Christ. Second of all, the responsibility to Jesus Christ. The responsibility to Jesus Christ. So he transitions from... Who do people say that the Son of Man is? To now, verses 15 and 16, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Let me, let me just take a little moment here. No QR code needed. No RSVP required. Just simply a question for your own personal reflection, asking you that question now. Not what do your friends think. What do you think? Not what does your mom think, not what does your dad think, not what does your home you're raised in think, not what does a pastor think, not, not what does Peter think. What do you think? Who do you think that Jesus is? I mean, that's the question that Jesus is getting to. He's kind of moving from the outside coming in to this central reality of the personal responsibility for every single one of his disciples to have to give an account who do they think Jesus is? Now, this is when we go from like, we're kind of cruising around the neighborhood with this like interesting religious conversation to now things just get real, real fast. Because look what happens. Verse 16. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, just as a point of explanation, Christ is not Jesus' last name. My first name is Eric, last name Bancroft. Jesus is not his first name and Christ is his last name. Christ is a declaration of deity. He is the anointed one. He is the Messiah. And this is exactly what's so mind-blowing. What Peter's saying is, it's not one thing for Jesus to self-identify as the Son of Man. That was profound in all of its biblical richness and all the Jewish ears that would understand that revelation. It's profound because of what, what Peter says in reply to the question of Jesus. He says, you are the Christ. Not a Christ. You are the Christ. The definite article. You are the Savior. The Son of not a son, no Mormon religion here. You are the son of the living God. I mean, that's, that's just a moment to like stop and ask the question, do you think the same way? Now, as you're considering that, let's just listen. I'll read to you. Don't turn there. I've got some other scriptures we're going to take a look at in a little bit. But just listen to what Paul says in Colossians chapter Let's see, chapter 1, he says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, that Christ, he is the image of the invisible God. Chapter 2, verse 9, just to kind of compound now with like a double serving of deity of Jesus in the book of Colossians, he says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, for in him, referring to Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. There's no JV deity, there's no mini-me deity, it is the fullness of God in Christ. And Peter is saying he recognizes that. He understands that. His whole hope is built on that. Perhaps some of you are familiar with the song, others of you might be new to Christianity, maybe you've not even heard it if you've not been here long enough. The title of the song, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. And the song says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ, my righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. 
The song goes on and says, when all around me my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, in him of my righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Friends, do you understand the significance of this? The significance is not us learning Bible facts about biographical people named Peter and what he said about Jesus. The question is, who, what do you say about Jesus? Where is your standing position? Where is the ground by which you stand on? What is the foundation of which your entire life is being built on? Captivated by even the words there. The significance of this, what it means for you to be in Christ. Some of you have been raised around religion in general, Christianity in particular. Some of you have kind of come in and out of the church. You know, it's kind of like a New Year's resolution, but you might be a few months late. January has passed us by, but hey, it's June, better late than never. Some of you are dealing with an overwhelming amount of some of the bad decisions you've made in the previous weeks or months, perhaps girlfriends, boyfriends, perhaps just in your own heart issues, and you're kind of here to kind of like just touch home base, kind of recharge a little bit like you're going to recharge as a battery, then kind of get back out in the world, kind of dealing with some issues. It's not uncommon. A lot of people think that way, but it'd be horribly wrong to continue to do so after today. The significance here in the text that Peter is teaching us is the clear identification of who Jesus is and the corresponding subsequent implications from that. It's not what does the church of Grace Church believe about Jesus, it's what do you believe about Jesus. And I don't mean to make that so subjective as if you can somehow create your own truth. I mean to say there is the truth and nothing else matters. It's the truth based on, built on who Jesus Christ is. This is the absolute foundational reality by which all of life is built. And this is the personal responsibility that we have. Individually, before the Lord, collectively as a group of Christians, to be built on this. Which takes us, thirdly, to the revelation of Jesus Christ. Talk about the various views of Jesus Christ in verses 13 and 14. We talked about, secondly, the responsibility of Jesus Christ, verses 15 and 16. Now, the revelation of Jesus Christ, verses 17. How did this happen? Like, did Peter just like got raised in the best home in addition to fishing with his maybe father or grandfather? They had good family devos with the scrolls. He went to synagogue more than the other disciples. How in the world did he give such a succinct, such a theologically accurate, such a biblically rich, such a life transformative truth? Jesus tells us, verse 17, Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now, friends, listen to me. It would seem like to the natural mind, having read everything we've read so far, up into Matthew 16, from Matthew 1, 2, 3, 4, and following, that you're like, this is kind of an obvious conclusion. I'm not sure why, like, Peter gets an honorable mention here. I mean, it just kind of feels like it's an obvious end result. Like, the guy's healing people. He's raising the dead. He's feeding thousands upon thousands of people. Doesn't it seem obvious? Isn't it just sort of a logical, deductive, reasoning moment? He just sort of like kind of clocked in, checked in, and said, hey, this isn't simple math. Two plus two equals four. Not that smart. I just paid attention in class. Jesus did not say, well done, Peter. You've been paying attention. Well done. You've been listening. Thank you. Somebody's finally getting it around here. 
I feel like I've been wasting my time with you guys. You keep coming with me, little, oh, little doubt. But, but now it looks like you have engaged. Now it looks like you have finally sat up and paid attention in class. And I'm rewarding gold stars, and I'm going to give you one first. It's not what he says. As blessed are you, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. What's he talking about? He's saying God the Father revealed to Peter who God the Son is. It was not because Peter was the smartest. It was not because the disciples just had the most amount of personal time that just by sheer mathematical exposure of time, he could get it. It was actually something that's known throughout the Scriptures as the doctrine, the teaching of regeneration. And I want to show this, I want to tease this out because it is so encouraging and humbling at the same time. So, keeping your hand in the book of Matthew, go to Ephesians. You're like, I don't know where Ephesians is. Just keep going to the right. Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. You're going to come to Ephesians chapter 2. I want you to see this for yourself because I want you to be able to know it later for yourself, not just like what the pastor said, so it must be true. Like, don't take my word for it. Let's read it. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul, different writer, talking to the Ephesians, different people, talking about their testimony. They were not Christians. Now they are. Track with me here. Chapter 2, Ephesians verse 1. You were dead and the trespasses and sins. You're like spiritually Lazarus. Verse 2. And when she once walked, you're like zombies, following the course of this world, go on the treadmill of life here, everybody else, following the prince of the power of the air under satanic influence, the spirit that's now at the work of the sons of Jesus. This is your testimony. Verse 3. Paul in humility says, among whom we all once lived. He's not picking on the Ephesians. He includes himself in this testimony. In the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And we're by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Get ready. Verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive. So to put that together, verse 4, but God made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that, why, why did He do this? So that in the coming ages, He might show not how smart you are, not how well raised you were, not how many times you went to church. He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Friends, listen to me. I mean, we could just like, let's go to prayer right now and let's just pray for like, you know, two hours and thank God for what we've been saved from. And in case you missed it, it's not uncommon, so I, I don't fault you. I want to make sure I pastor you well. In case you missed it, his explanation about faith is not like, okay, listen, um, if you thought it's like faith plus works, and if you're from a Roman Catholic background, that's how you've been taught, faith plus your sacraments, or faith plus like your, your morality, your faith plus stop sleeping with your girlfriend for crying out loud, or faith like, hey, lay aside all the cocaine, or faith plus like, you know what, you should be nicer, stop being such a jerk, or faith plus, he's like, no, no, that's, that's not what he's saying, it's faith alone in Christ. Christ alone. And if you only think, though, that that's what this is about, that's only differentiating, hey, no works, just all faith, 
you're only halfway there in this text. The part I don't want you to miss is what he's saying earlier in verses 4 and 5. God, because of his character of mercy, because of his character of love, even though we didn't deserve it, we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive. He revealed to us, as, Peter, as Jesus says to Peter, this is regeneration. This is, in the truest sense of what it means to be born again. This is new birth. It is spiritual. Man in his natural state is dead in his trespasses, but God makes alive. Regeneration is a radical change. After regeneration, we begin to see and hear and seek after the godly things. We begin to live a life of faith and holiness. Now, Christ is formed in our hearts. We are now partakers of this divine nature. We are indeed new creatures in Christ, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians. God is the source of this transformation, as we see in Ephesians chapter 2. And his great love and his free gift, his unbelievable grace and his unbelievable mercy is the reason for it. This is why you and I sing. A lot of us weren't like big singers before we got saved. I mean, some of you, maybe you're like in your car, just jamming out your Spotify playlist on the way to work. But friends, worshiping the Lord, regardless of musical instruments being used, regardless of personalities and facilitating, singing unto God is like, the most natural, instinctive thing in you. Why? Because of the revelation of the Son of God, there can only be one response. It's worship. Worship. I mean, we're like going for broke, and some of us are weeping because we're overwhelmed by our sin. Some of us are just celebrating because we're just amazed by the forgiveness of our sin, but we're worshiping. We love Jesus. And we see this revelation. We see it is indeed the gift of God. Don't take my word for it. Look at even how Grace Church's confession of faith, which is our doctrinal statement, says it. So all the members know this. If you became a member of the church, this was the confession of faith. If you come to our foundations class, you get taught this as to what this church believes as a biblical summary of all that this says. Look on the screen behind me of what it says about regeneration. This is our doctrinal statement. We believe that in order to be saved, sinners must be regenerated or born again. That regeneration consists in giving a holy disposition to the mind that is affected in a manner above our comprehension, we don't know how it happens, by the power of the Holy Spirit and connection with divine truth, right? Romans 10, faith comes by hearing the word of Christ. So as to secure our voluntary obedience to the gospel, no one's being dragged into heaven. Oh, we want to be forgiven of our sins when we know that there's a Savior and its proper evidence appears in the holy fruits of repentance and faith and newness of life. Now, for as impressive as that is, as a summary, <laughs> there's no one greater to learn this from than Jesus himself. Go to John chapter 3. So you're in Ephesians. Now you're going back to John. Like, okay, Pastor, I'm new to the Bible. Where's John? Well, if you're in Matthew, so you a couple books to the right. Gospel of John, we've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, John chapter 3. What is the most famous verse known by so many people? John 3, 16, right? A lot of people don't know the context, the conversation that that's coming out of. This is going to be so much fun. Track with me here. John chapter 3, watch what takes place here. John chapter 3, verse 1. Now, there's a man of the Pharisees, we know these guys, named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, there's regeneration, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He will never get it. Nicodemus says to him, understandably, well, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, that's a human birth, and of the Spirit, that's regeneration, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. 
That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. And here's the illustration Jesus gives, verse 8. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. We'll get to that in a second. Verse 9, Nicodemus said to him, well, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know, and we bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And, if Moses, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man, there is title again about himself, must be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Here's the verse. Here is the effect of the wind blowing. Verse 16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in Him is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, the light that's come into the world, and the people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works be exposed. Verse 21, but whoever does what is true comes to the light so that that may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Friends, say right there in John, say right there, but listen to me just briefly as a summary. Jesus is having a conversation with a seemingly a very well-taught religious guy who still can't get it. He can't get it. And Jesus is saying, like, hey, listen, you have to be born, to have, be a part of the kingdom of God, to be a part of God's kingdom, God's rule. You have to be born of the kingdom of God. He's like, how are you born again? He says, you're born again by the water, which is a reference to, to physical birth and the reality of what happens when a baby is born and that reality, that physiological reality, what's taking place, and of the Spirit. He's like, how are you born of the Spirit? How does that happen? And he says, you never know when it happens, you see its effect. It's like the wind. Is anybody ever like, hey, the, 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 there goes the wind. What is the, he says, no, you see the effect of it. What's the effect of regeneration? What's the effect of being born again? You see people who believe. Peter, in Matthew 16, is professing, and Jesus says, my father revealed that to you. My father revealed that to you. Which is why every Christian is like, praise be to God. Praise be to God. And to see it, go back to John 1. So we're in John 3. Just turned two chapters earlier. You got to enjoy this. You got to just love this. Look at what John is saying about Jesus. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. He's referring to Jesus. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Jesus is responsible for creation. Verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, talking about John the Baptist. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light, talking about Jesus. Verse 9, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. So they don't know. They don't get it. Verse 11, he came to his own, Jewish people, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So there's the relationship, children of God. Here's the key, verse 13. These children of God, these people who became followers of Christ, who were born not of blood, not because they're Jewish, nor of the will of the flesh, because they just strong-armed themselves into getting God to accept them, nor of the will of man, anybody else on their behalf, but of God. Friends, this is remarkable. Think of the song, And Can It Be? The lyrics to that, long my imprisoned spirit lay, 
fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Oh, the grace of God, which takes us forth and final to the promise of Jesus Christ. The various views of Jesus Christ, the responsibility to Jesus Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ, and now the promise of Jesus Christ. You go back to Matthew chapter 16. Look what's being said there. He says, verse 18, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, this verse is the verse used to support the existence of the Roman Catholic Church. Some of you come from Roman Catholicism. My my grandfather used to be a Roman Catholic priest. Catholic means universal. Roman is because of the traditional belief of the Roman Catholic Church that the successor to Peter, named as the Pope, chosen by the church council, the the cardinals, the successor is to rule from Rome. And they base their existence on this single verse upon this. And their interpretation is that it's on Peter. It's you, Peter. It's based upon who you are. I'm building my church on you. And so every sort of descendant from Peter, not biological descendant, not genealogical connection, but every sort of named successor now sits as the head over all of the church. He is, in the words of Roman Catholic theology, he is the vicar of Christ. He's the representation of Christ. This is not just a bad interpretation. This is a heretical interpretation. The truth is, That what he is saying here, acknowledging his name, Peter, which means rock, he takes the name and he has a turn of a phrase. The rock he's referring to is the profession Jesus just made. It is upon the rock of this profession, turning of the phrase, upon this, I will build. And notice who the church belongs to. My church. It's a profoundly significant statement that Jesus is making. The church is built on confession. A church that forgets that will indeed fail. Friends, if you've ever wondered what does it take to become a member of Grace Church, it's not your pledge to help out around here. Not your promise to help carry some of the financial burden to help care for the cost financially and to minister to people. It starts first and foremost on who do you say that Jesus is? We are a confessing church. Now, I'm not looking for the words. I'm looking for the life that would reflect the words. Jesus says you shall know them by their fruit. August 8th, 1991, the tallest structure on our planet snapped and collapsed. It was the tallest structure on our planet. It stood twice the height of the next tallest structure in Europe and would not be surpassed by any other tower of construction on earth until 20 years later when the Burj Khalifa Tower was built. It was known as the Warsaw Radio Tower. And it was held up by trusses and wires and sent out radio signals that could be picked up from Europe and Africa and even North America. From 1970 to 1974, it took four years to build this. It was 420 tons of steel and lattice. It's massive. Because of its radio signal, it reached so far in its broadcast. What happened to it? What happened to it was that it fell into disrepair. It stopped working on it. 
And to the surprise of many, due to its lack of maintenance and not inspecting its foundations and dealing with its cables that were attaching and holding it up, an accident took place during high winds where they're replacing some cables and the entire thing collapsed. Gone. But one stood as the highest structure fell. Friends, this story has happened throughout history for a millennia and beyond. Massive churches known in their unbelievable reach, connecting across multiple continents that don't exist today. Now, that could be for a variety of reasons. The promise we see in the Scriptures is Christ building His church, the universal church, but it's visibly seen and expressly demonstrated through local churches. You can think of one famous church in Seattle, Washington, started in 1996, grew big under its leadership, eventually had 15 locations in four states, 260,000 sermon views every single week. Within 17 years, they had an average attendance of 13,000 people. Like I said, 15 locations in four states. 18 months later, they didn't exist ever again. Some of those locations broke off in their own churches. Other ones don't even exist at all. Why? Because it was once built on something solid and substantial, the gospel of Jesus Christ, but over time it slowly got changed. There's something else. Friends, we would do well to learn this lesson ourselves as a very young church who is building its foundation on the gospel. For all of the possible ideas we can come up with and programs we can do and personalities that we can get involved in leadership and people that we could hire and ministry we could do, friends, we have to recognize the significance here by sobriety of consideration that we need to be a humble church recognizing that no matter how big we can be, no matter how far we can reach, if we do not continue to examine our foundation, we too will crumble, falling into disrepair. The good news, though, is what Jesus says here. He will build His church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What does this mean? This means, your translation might say the gates of Hades, this idea of gates of hell is meaning that the church is not like in this defeating position or this defensive position, it's an offensive position. God is advancing His work, God is accomplishing His purposes, God in every tribe, tongue, and nation around the clock and every time zone is advancing, often unseen, the name of His Son for the glory of Himself to all the nations, preparing a bride for Himself and He will accomplish it. Here's the good news. Grace Church will come and go, but Jesus Christ as the head of the church will always lead, will always win, and will promise to return for His bride. And we will enjoy the marriage supper of the Lamb together as He celebrates the work that by the power of the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity Godhead that raised Christ from the dead, indeed has done. And you'll notice this phrase here in verse 19. It says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. He's speaking here about the church's authority as an expression of the administration of the Word of God, enforcing the authority of Christ. And you're like, okay, that, that sounds intriguing. Come back in Matthew 18. We're going to get to that because Jesus picks right back up two chapters later in this very reality of what he's teaching here. Here's the question to bring it to us tonight. Where are you tonight and who you say Jesus is? Where are we as a church building our priority, our confidence in? What do we want people to think about us as a church? We want them to think we take them seriously. We love people sacrificially, consistently, no matter where you come from. But more importantly, we love Jesus Christ. We take Him seriously. We want people to know of the hope found in His life, death, and resurrection. 
for our church to be built on that, for people to hear that and to advance that ministry, if for God's grace, for years to come.